I posted a few videos now on solo GMing, and here I'm going to put some stuff together, most of it from 19, late 1970s, early 80s, uh, war games and RPG sets to create an old school fantasy adventure. And one of the uh, principles, or some of the principles that I'm using, I've talked about in my videos on the mindset of a solo GM and some tools and tricks for the solo GM. And you can see the links to those down below. You can see some notes I've made here that is going to remind me what I'm doing vis-a-vis -vis the bigger picture thing. So for my rubric using this Valkenburg Castle here, uh, primarily this game for the map and the content, the Fantasy Trip uh, Wizard in particular in Fantasy Trip is going to give me magic traps and my two Generative resources here are going to be the uh, Tome of Adventure Design and also the Classic Dungeon Design Guide. Those are going to be some generative things. We're going to get to that first. And then I'm going to be using the Mythic um, Emulator as well as my Percentile Chart for some restrictive elements. And then I've got some other notes here, uh, some more suggestive stuff, maybe bring in the Beast Lord, some Death Maze, and Citadel of Blood um, monsters. I haven't quite figured all that out yet. But the first step here is going to be um, what I would always do first, which is to take a look at, um, you can see my note up here, this meta, my meta story, because um, I want to provide a general, um, a general background story that may or may not come into play as I get into the dungeon, that may or may not inform some things that happen. So this is going to be what I'm calling the meta story, the biggest element, um, the most external element. And from that, I'm going to turn to the classic dungeon design guide, and I'm going to show you how I can use this guide and create the story just on the fly. So we're going to actually do it here on camera, if I can sort of get the whole thing on camera, to show you that that um, these are actually the random roles I'm doing and what I create from that. And you can see what you need to bring in when you have your structure. So, all right, I had to readjust my camera. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to the Classic Dungeon Design Guide. We're going to move into the Adventure Scenarios section of the book. And it's a D100 table, and it's going to give us... Uh, basic plot hook, a kind of meta, what I call the meta story, and let's see what we get when we do our roll here. We rolled a 38, and 38 on this table is going to be, all right, the gate. The dungeon is the shell surrounding a magical gate. For example, the gateway to hell or a dimensional rift which leads into another time world or alternate dimension. The adventurers either want to enter the dungeon and use the gate to enter another world, or they want to destroy it to prevent an invasion or some other kind of terrible calamity. Okay. All right. We will make a note of that off camera here. And um, so I'll just do the gate. And that's on page 40. We'll come back and show you what we work out with this. All right, and then next thing we're doing is we're turning to the section on the unusual basis of operation. And I like to, I like to give my place a, um, or my party a place to be coming from, even though in this case we're going to be, the action is really going to be when we get to the dungeon and we're not going to do any of the traveling. I find it helps me narratively to have some kind of anchor in mind, some place that we came from. We have now the basic of the story of what we're doing when we get there. And let's see what we roll here. We rolled a 15. So we'll look and see on this chart where we are coming from with a 15. A tyrant's city-state of Colosseum circuses and slave quarters. All right, so we are, I guess, escaping some type of tyrant. So we'll make a note of that and tyrant city-state. And then the last thing I want to do to set the scene is roll on the um, stronghold area or the stronghold description in here because I want us to be arriving at the specific um, it's a castle. I'm deciding where the first place, you know, our entry point is going to be a stronghold. And I just want to see, I want to see what that place is going to be, because that's going to also help me when I construct this uh, meta story that I'm going to 
do on the camera so you can sort of see how I write it out and how that's going to inform the rest of what happens. So we rolled a 47 for that and this brings us to 47 Hall of Tapestries. Okay. So Hall of Tapestries is what we where we're arriving and um, again we have this concept of there's some type of gate somewhere and we're escaping a tyrant city and we're arriving in the Hall of Tapestry. So I'm going to show you after I think about it a little bit what I create from that. The dungeon hides an old gate that protects the entrance to another dimension. There are guards that are watching this gate and they must be persuaded to relinquish their hold on the space one way or another, either uh, friend in a friendly way or an unfriendly way. Our party has been chosen to secure the castle, to secure the gate, and allow for safe passage for their citizens in the city that is under a rule of tyranny to pass through this gate somehow. We are entering the Hall of Tapestries, as we said, but I decided that the tapestries weren't enough, so I also felt that that would be a throne room with tapestries in there. So I created, through some random rolls, a throne, a silver throne of the four elements, and it is one where gas is forming and presenting itself as an elemental, and the element that it represents based on this D4 roll that you saw me do is air and air is associated with the mind, it is associated with some philosophical things as we will discuss. I'm not going to go in detail uh, too much about the party except as it comes up in the story, but I will tell you a little bit about it so you know what's going on. This is my party. I've got a thief, a priest, a wizard, a scholar, and one fighter, and um, I don't know why I chose this configuration. I tend to go this way. I know I should probably have two fighters and maybe not the scholar, but uh, I'm going to have a little more emphasis here on story maybe than fighting, not that they're mutually exclusive, so I went this way. My priest is a dwarf, and I'm using the basic functionality of the melee wizard in the labyrinth system. Um, for the most part, it's going to come into play just in terms of the assignment of the spells and so our priest here is going to carry eight spells because he is a priest and he will have some uh, capabilities in that regard and uh, the basic values are coming from the rules in that system in terms of what the difference is but say between the dwarf and the elf for example we have a thief with uh, who's an elf and he's got a high dexterity here as you would expect he also has a special movement allowance that's going to be greater than that of the rest, uh, quite greater than the, that of the rest. We have a human wizard, and he's going to have the most spells. His spells are down here. And um, we also have our scholar. He's got a cat familiar with him, and I have some stats for that. That's going to come from in the labyrinth, but I didn't write them down. I notice here. He has no weapons, and he is going to have some talents. I, I sort of glossed over the talents here. We are going to have some talents with weapons here for the priest, and the thief is going to have also some talents that will have to do with uh, weaponry. And our wizard is going to have some talents as well. And of course the spells, our scholar is going to have a lot of assessment talents. And finally our fighter, most of his or all of his talents are really going to be weapon based. So that makes up our party, and we'll see as we move through a little bit um, how I refer back to these talents in terms of what might be something that could be used or not. There's one more resource that I often use that I didn't refer to, I haven't referred to in other videos or really earlier here, although you might have seen it pop up briefly in the um, uh, time lapse. This is the Dictionary of Symbols, and it is an alphabetical reference, very, very thick, lengthy. Not everything you would want is in here. Of course, how could it be? But when I come to something, like for example, the air elemental, I looked up the, uh, the four elements and I saw historically and cross-culturally what air has represented to various cultures. And then I also looked up just air on its own to note, uh, that's actually obviously an easy one to find here at the beginning. This is alphabetical, as I said, um, to see if there was something here that could, just to note down, um, and there is um, a description of the 
of whatever it is that you're referring to. And again, it is cross-cultural, and some of the entries are, are more cross-cultural than others. But what I noted down of relevance, perhaps we'll see how it comes into play, is that air is associated with spirituality. It is linked, of course, to, uh, to breath and to wind. It is seen as the zone between heaven and earth. And it can be the symbol of invisible life and a dimension of communication between heaven and earth. And you will recall that um, our sort of meta story has to do with this gate between something. So the fact that there is an air elemental in the throne room and the tapestry room that we're entering initially is thematically tied to this. And perhaps we can begin to see this castle as the locus maybe between either heaven and earth or um, just two different dimensions that um, are communicating in some way with one another and connected by this gate that needs to be opened so that our people in the uh, tyrannic, tyrannically ruled city can escape and get some relief. Here's a look at the map from Valkenburg Castle and we have set up, this is my starting position as it were here, over to the left are my party, and we'll take a look at that in a second. I'll say at the outset, you know, I haven't I haven't started playing yet, so I'm, this is my best guess as to what is going to happen and the counters that I'm using here to represent my party. So you will remember, perhaps, that I have a dwarf priest here, and I've got two sets of counters. Again, I'm not totally sure what I'm using here. These both say wizard, wizard, and I've got the priest and the wizard. These are my magic users indicated clearly, so I've got to keep that straight. What I have here are counters, um, and I should say these are all from different games, which, you know, it always makes me kind of nervous to pull stuff out like this, but I do keep track of it, so there you have it. I have these counters here because I'm going to be using assigning uh, magic points uh, to the various magic users. This fellow has 12, the wizard has 12, and the priest has 8. And as I use them, I'm going to tra either transfer them over or pull them away to indicate what I've got left because I don't want to do, I want to minimize the amount of written record keeping that I have. I've also got my elf, uh, let's see, my human scholar has no weapon, so that's this, ca uh, this counter right here. That's, I guess, semi weaponless, if we can see it there. And I've got uh, the ranged weapon here with a bow and arrow is going to be my fighter, even though they both have ranged capacity. And my thief here is the elf thief. Doesn't really look like an elf, but I'm, you know, I've got what I've got. The dice that I'm using, the main mechanic is a d6 in the rules for Valkenburg. And I've got... Um, two different size d6s of the same color that I may use in some way. I like to do that if I'm rolling for, say, monsters and me or whatever, so I don't have to, I can minimize the rolls that way. But again, if I don't like that, maybe I'll go to two different colors. And then off to the side here, I've got um, a variety of other dice in case, just in case I need to come up with something I don't know yet. In terms of the map itself, we'll get into what uh, these what the map actually means, but I have seeded it with inverted magic items that I pulled from another game and have placed, just I just randomly placed them because I want to encourage my party not to simply travel through the shortest path down to the, th the bottom level where lie the the princess here and some other family members who are the ones that need to be rescued. The gate is guarded by this, um, what is it called here? This, well, it's called a guardian that I found. And again, this, you know, subject to change. I'll say that right at the outset because I don't know how this is going to evolve. And when you're doing something like this, you have to be fluid, or at least I have to be fluid in realizing that I may change the setup. This might not work. But what I have done is seeded some magic items here that I am meant to obtain that will give me some aid and also perhaps contribute to my leveling up capacity. Again, have not yet worked that leveling up out. Along with those items, I have these plundered um, chits here from the same game. That's 
going to indicate when we have successfully rated this area so that we know that we have done that again. Could it work out? Maybe, maybe not. And finally, I've got, um, I found this counter here um, that looks to me like some religious something, obviously, and it is guarded by the undead. There's some magic items here, particularly in this pit area. This may be part of our adventure. It may not. It is in the third level there, so sort of a midpoint. Um, it could provide a midpoint um, to our story. In this cup here, I have my uh, monsters that are going to be drawn out when needed. And then we look now to the actual Valkenburg Castle rules, finally getting back to the actual game here, for the uh, map designation and then also for uh, some other factors, and notably the combat. So this is the designation of the map. We have solid walls doors underneath them. You can see the lock door indicated by this little asterisk. So just to look at the map here, this is how it shows up there. Um, these would be locked doors and regular doors. The G stands for guardhouse, and I did not place actually anyone in there. So there are guardhouses around where one would expect to find people. So we'll see how We'll see how I end up working that out, but I didn't actually place anything there. There are stairways between levels and ladders too, and the leveling of the um, the map here comes into play in combat because there are value modifiers in terms of fighting above and below uh, from levels and looking through the staircases and ladders as you would expect, and there are also the significant thing about the combat has to do with the narrowness or width of the area in which you're fighting. And that to me is a very interesting mechanic in this game and one I'm going to try to stick to as much as possible. So let's take a closer look at that right now. When I'm doing something like this, one of the things I like to do is to take a look at the designer's notes for the game because I feel that that's a good place to start in terms of at least what the designer felt was significant about the game or unique about the game or important to the designer about the game and see whether I can use that as the basis for whatever I am building off of so I don't jettison what the designer him or herself felt. And in this particular case, it made sense to me in terms of what they felt was the uh, sort of core of this game. The original basis for Valkenburg Castle was to create a combat game that portrayed indoor fighting in three dimensions on multiple floors of a building. I had always felt that the various other dungeon games glossed over the combat aspects for submer or submerged them in a massive colorful detail, etc., it's a combat game, fighting your way in, do whatever you need to do, and fight your way back out. He talked about going to squad level, which I'm not doing that, but he said here, I began a careful examination of how units armed with edged weapons fight in confined spaces. It came as no surprise that only the men on the front now did any fighting, so I based the combat system, and this is the part that's key, on the width of the front, which was of course the width of the hallway. The individual combat system was worked out to allow individuals to have a significant and sometimes decisive influence on events. What is key to the combat here and what I am going to retain as much as I can is this notion that the um, the width or narrowness of where you are and the adjacency has a big impact on combat. So it's not just the frontal aspect, but here he's talking about the narrow um, aspect and the fighting also within wide or open spaces and how these are defined. And the CRTs such as they are, or I should say really, you know, well, they're CRTs back here, have to do with in terms of how many uh, wounds that you would in, uh, inflict based on your die roll, whether you are fighting in a narrow space, a wide space, or an open space. And this is um, at the squad level. He's got it divided up into squad level and then individual level. I'm not going to be working that way, so what I'm going to be using will be some 
type of combination of these, but um, I'm working off of this concept of the physical space impacting the wounds and the effectiveness of the uh, attack, and then these modifiers, the adjustments that go to the die roll, uh, we will be using these. I think I'm going to be actually adding a little bit to these because we'll have some variability that isn't here. So I need to work that out as I go. And again, um, you may be saying to yourself, well, how is it possible to work out a combat result as you go in a game or work out? Uh, I talked about not being sure about the leveling up. This is part of what happens when you do something like this when you create on the fly for yourself and you if you're comfortable with that there is a lot of richness that can develop if you're uncomfortable with it and are somebody that needs to have something set up all in advance which I understand uh, certainly in an actual game as opposed to sort of an RPG ish game ish hybrid you would need um, then you, I suppose, could do that. But for me, for right now, for doing this in this way, I'm just not sure yet about how I'm going to accumulate, say, experience points to level up. I've started to make some notes about it um, and think, well, I could possibly go off of an existing system here. And um, this, these are some notes that I've made in terms of what gives you experience points. This comes from In the Labyrinth. But I don't know that that's actually going to work because honestly I haven't even worked out all the values yet that I'm going to be using for the the monster. So again, it's a work in progress as I go. But the general structure here for combat is going to involve this notion of the basing it off of the existing map and the space that is being fought in and then applying various modifiers to a d6 roll getting the roll then looking up my what my adjusted die roll is and how many wounds it causes so somehow on the basis of this as I get into it I will make it work and that is really the core of what I'm going to be using here from Valkenburg Castle Additionally, there are other things such as hidden doors. Now, hidden doors here is basically a d6 roll, and you know, a one or two means you found a door. That's not terribly interesting to me, but the idea that there could be a hidden door, I'm going to factor in to um, my my movement through the dungeon to see whether um, whether that works. In terms of movement, I'm using the basic movement that is assigned here because it is scaled to the map. Um, and things like going up stairs and ladders and things, I will follow what has been worked out here because I think that that's going to be appropriate to the scale so I don't have somebody just running off all the way to the end of the dungeon. Now I did give my thief, I believe it is, my thief picked up a lot of extra movement from the um, rules in uh, that I was using in, to create from Wizard. Uh, he's got a movement allowance of 12 and 10 with armor. Again, does he even have armor? I don't know. I have to get into it to see whether this scale is going to work. It might not, so I may need to divide it in half or whatever, and that is something that I'm comfortable having as an open question at this point. Let's see, combat, uh, we got the wounds there. We have assigned um, we have assigned health to everybody. I think everybody's got an eight health. I'd have to check back on that to see. Um, I have not yet, another thing I have not yet worked out is healing. When that will happen, how that will happen, in what capacity, I don't know. <laughs> I need to create a situation where we have diminishing, diminishing, diminishing health, and then the capacity to heal um, be can't, because they can't be healed so quickly that there's no danger. And yet, if everybody dies in the first room, you know, that's the end of the game and the end of the experience, and I don't want that. We talked about combat. There is, uh, there is both melee and long-range combat here. I will be sticking, for the most part, to these rules in terms of what can happen and how that happens. In my case, I have a couple of characters that have been given the capacity for both, and um, we will make a determination as to what type of attack we're using following these rules, which I'm not going to go into too much in detail, but we'll see it when we play. Uh, magic, as mentioned, I'm sticking mostly to, or 
largely to the wizard's magic in terms of the spells they have, how they are cast, what the casting cost is, etc. There is a limited Within this game, there are a limited number of spells that are given, and you could certainly play out this game using just these spells. But to me, those are one of the most interesting points of it, and I certainly want to flesh that out a bit more. I talked about how I seeded the uh, dungeon with some treasures that I pulled in from another game. I will adapt the values and the meaning of those magical items to this gameplay when I obtain them, and I'll show you how I do that. There is here, within the rules, rules for searching for random treasure uh, that has been left over the years by various raiding parties, and there are some um, rules here also to determine what the treasure is. Again, I'm moving away from this because it's a little bit limited, but you should know if you're seeking this game out that the rules for this are here and are contained simply within this game. So it is really a fantasy dungeon crawl in that regard in terms of what you get with the actual game. There are traps as well. I haven't really talked about traps, and that's also something that I've made a note. I've got to figure out how and when I will determine what is in a room. That may come more from the quote-unquote RPG aspects of it as we travel through and ask questions of the space and determine what the actual locale is. So we'll see how that goes. And... Um, the monsters we are pulling in from a different game, and so we're going to skip over all of that. But again, it is in here per these rules. If you wanted to play with just these rules, there are certainly rules for monsters. There are rules for things like explosives and other special items that are contained within this game that I am not going to use because I'm going to be focusing mostly on the magic and to the extent that I go off... Um, go off into other ways of getting through the map, it will be magic-based as opposed to these explosives, which are, um, you know, these are very, very basic, essentially D6 rolls with a few modifiers that um, I will not be doing. So that is um, basically what I'm pulling out of the rules. There are, within these rules, just to show you properly, so you know if you're interested in picking this little game up, they give you some basic rules for setting up a solitaire game, a random dungeon, with the 54 um, counters that are provided in the game some suggestions about um, setting up adventure groups, and even how to conduct an adventure. And then there are some scenarios that they suggest, a treasure-seeking one, a rescue one, which is more or less what I'm doing here, a combat, and there is a dragon counter, and um, a suggestion as to where you could place the dragon. So there are there is a rubric in here for playing the game as it is, and in fact, somewhere in here, and I don't know where it is, well, it's right here, and I'll just end with that. Not that not that we need this told to us, but the designer himself says um, that I was determined to keep the game simple to play. He talks about record keeping, and people who wanted more would add it, and those who didn't wouldn't. And then he says, needless to say, you may feel free to add or change anything from creating new scenarios to grafting the rules from other games on similar subjects. Well, that's what I've done, and now we're going to take a look at how that's going to actually work. We enter this hall of tapestries ready to perhaps fight this air elemental that is here, and I found in the fantasy trip, well, actually in the labyrinth in the part of the fantasy trip, I found an air elemental, and I will show you what we discovered. And this, you know, this is the type of flexibility you need sometimes here. We, it turns out that this is the the least dangerous of the elementals. They're rarely found. Should one be hostile, it will be no more than a nuisance, blowing sand and small objects in your face, etc., unless it has this high strength. So um, it seems rare that it would actually be something we would fight. Um, it goes on, if it's something very strong, what it can do. It appears as a whirlwind that will lift anyone missing their saving roll and dash them to their deaths. Well, that seems pretty rare. And in fact, when I went to my questioning and... Um, 
and asked of the question, would this be hostile to us? It would be very unlikely, and indeed it was not hostile to us. They're also totally unaffected by any physical weapon, fire, or lightning. Other spells affect them. So had it been hostile, we would have had a chance to use some of our magic spells right away, but it wasn't as per um, what you would expect. So this led me then not into some combat that I was anticipating, but it led me to go through a series of questions that ascertained, um, I did all this off camera in terms of the die roll and looking up, but we talked to the air elemental and um, we determined a couple of things. We determined that um, it's gonna help us with our mission, but it can't guide us there. So my thought was maybe, um, you know, it can waft its way down to the path we need to take, but no, it can't. It won't come with us. But yes, we can come back and seek help from it later on. We were getting ready to leave, and then we learned that there is actually something in this room that can help us. I thought, well, maybe it's a tapestry, because it's a tapestry room after all, but no, it was not a tapestry, and actually there's no other treasure in the room and nothing hidden in the room. So um, this led me to do some investigation of the room itself, and I'll point out for those of you just tuning into the video now, when I'm using primarily for the locale generation is the Tome of Adventure Design and then possibly the Classic Dungeon Design Guide, although that's that came in more earlier. In any case, investigation actually did reveal the treasure chest, but per the earlier questioning, I figured it was empty. This was damaged but repaired, so it suggests that somebody um, was taking care with this che treasure chest to try to repair it, but we think, based on earlier questioning, as I said, it's empty. There was a lamp there, too. Weren't getting very far, and then um, I asked, well, can you give us something to help? And the answer was yes. And then I initially started to roll up um, a potion that was green and viscous and rotten smelling, but I realized conceptually this is an air elemental. It's not going to really be carrying something that's like thick. Um, so I went back to the drawing board and we rolled up a green smoky potion and uh, we asked, can we can you tell us more about that right now? And the answer was no. So I think we are done here in the tapestry room. There doesn't seem to be anything else lurking about with this air elemental. It turns out to be a peaceful, peaceful thing that is causing the space to be relatively peaceful. Our choices now, however, are going to become a little grimmer, I think, because as you can see from the map, we have two options here, two doors. They're unlocked doors. They both lead to areas with guard houses. There's this door here and this door up here. Ultimately, we are trying to go down to the second level, um, so we'll probably go here, but I need to think about that and um, come back and decide and show you. I've decided to move, move south on the map to the southern guard room, and this is the basic configuration of how it looks. There's a lot of doors here. We've come down a corridor, and I guess the first thing we'll do is we'll just figure out, um, we'll just describe where we came from. Why not? Now, I'm using, I mentioned earlier what I'm using, but I'm going to go for that to this um, Tome of Adventure Design. And um, for the basics of my, the beginning of my room, I'm going to go here. When you have your own resources, you know, you'll sort of have a sense as you play with them what you might turn to. And um, again, you know, per other things I've said, I think for me the experience is... Um, more enjoyable when I realize that even just the process of figuring out where I'm going to go is part of uh, the game that I'm playing. So uh, we're going to look here at uh, the nature of this transition and we rolled a 36. Let's see what we've got here. Well, it's a door or archway and it is normal. So uh, let's look at this archway here and we've got a 66 on that. We have some carved skulls, and I'm just going to move across here and, you know, shorten it up. We have bones tied together in strands to form a curtain. Um, <clears throat> it's a double arch, a pillar at the miller, and it is an oval-shaped opening in the wall. So 
we're, we know this is a guard room and there's a bunch of skulls there, so I guess this is going to signal to us that they're serious and they mean business here. We're going to bravely walk through that skulled um, entryway into, um, I'm going to see what I get here with this stronghold, you know, a guard room is going to be a stronghold area and I'm going to see if I get anything here that is of interest here. Uh, we rolled up a 50 and... Um, that's not of interest. So we're going to skip and roll again. Now, what I'll do sometimes on a roll that, um, so a 50 described a kennel. Well, that's that's out of my, out of my storyline. So when I do a roll that isn't working, I can just flip the dice and see if maybe five is going to work better for me. An armory, okay. So not only is it a guard room, but it's an armory. There are going to be extra weapons here, I suppose, that we may or may not be able to obtain. As mentioned, we know there are four four orcs, and um, now we're going to look at what happens when we encounter them. Parting the curtain of skulls, we move through into the guard room. It has a flagstone floor, stone walls, little to obscure the four orcs that are there amid tons of weaponry. We are going to end up having combat here, but the entire situation, we're in the guard room here. There is no nothing obscuring the our party from these orcs right now. This entire situation is going to be called an encounter, and the healing um, rules that I'm going to put into play are going to be after every three encounters. Why? Well, just because, basically. Um, that's what I'm deciding right now. This may not work out. I mean, the goal here is to have you need to, obviously, manage the resources of the health in your party um, enough so that there is tension, but not so much that everybody is killed or, in this case, you know, say, knocked unconscious um, until they heal, like, right away, because that's not fun. And this is where it could could require a little bit of tweaking as we go, but in any event, this is our encounter, and the first thing that needs to happen here is to note that we have our two magic users, and we also have this scholar. Now, I mentioned earlier that the human scholar is going to be um, having a cat familiar. He has no weapons, but he has a cat familiar. The reason he can have this cat familiar is because his fellow human wizard, not the dwarf priest, but the human wizard, is going to be using his control animal spell, to, um, at, which can be an ongoing throne spell, um, to allow the his colleague, his party member, to have this cat familiar. This is going to cost two um, magic points to cast and then one point per turn to have it in effect. So um, we are going to need to be using these strength points, these magic points, in this manner to keep this spell going with the cat familiar. That's the first thing to note. The other thing to note is that I am picking up from, in the labyrinth, the um, nuisances rule. And in that rule, what it says is basically every 30 hexes, in this case every 30 squares, if I can remember to keep track of it, you roll for a nuisance item and or a nuisance uh, dungeon thing that happens. And these are things like rats coming in or various slime or whatever. So I'm going to be lifting that in. We're not going to start out by rolling for it, but I am going to be keeping track of um, off screen as to um, our advancement through the 30 hexes. So we're going to be doing that. We're also going to be rolling for traps in a room and um, it's just going to be at that point a d6 roll and on a 5 or a 6 there will be a trap and then I will follow the trap rules from in the labyrinth to uh, set up the trap and we will use the saving roll rule to see whether it can be detected, whether it can be um, escaped from or whatever. So we're picking up that. We're also picking up the rule that in order to um, determine whether or not an attack is successful in combat, you have to do a two hit roll. So it's not simply um, that you are going to be placing a wound based on the combat table that we're using, but even prior to that, we need to see if we're actually going to be able to hit something. So I'm following those rules, but I'm following the combat tables, as I showed you earlier, from Castle Valkenberg in terms of the uh, modifiers to the, the die roll and what wounds are actually going to be um, landed, assuming there is a successful landing of rules, of, of uh, wounds. And finally, I'm going to follow for leveling up 
I'm going to follow more or less the experience point rule from In the Labyrinth, which is basically that um, magic users get an experience point even if they cast a spell and it's not successful. They get it a point if they do damage. Um, if you do successfully kill a creature, you're going to get points based on that creature's. Now, it would be based on that creature's dexterity, but of course we're using creatures from another game. So in this regard, um, they're going to get points based on the um, creature's combat modifier, which is a term from the death maze. So, you know, you have to be, in terms of what I'm doing, you have to be comfortable with sort of taking bits and pieces of different elements and seeing how they can fit together um, and, you know, they are different rule sets, I'll just say that from the outset, so it doesn't match up totally, but you get that. There's also a experience point thing in, in the Labyrinth, which I always liked, which is you get five experience points per character for one hour of real-time play. So you get experience just for, you know, being in the game, as it were. And so I'm going to be doing that. Of course, it's hard to keep track of the time I spend here because so much of it is, you know, interspersed with editing and et cetera. But whatever, every now and then, uh, somebody, everybody's going to get five experience points. And you also get experience points if you have have a saving roll success. So based on all of that, there will be experience points that are allocated. I'm going to keep track of that off screen. And uh, per 100 experience points, you will be able to level up a value on your three main values um, of intelligence, of strength, and of dexterity. A quick explanation of how the attack is going to work from the side of the, the monster. This is a, not in our encounter right now. This is a skeleton, and you see this number here. This is a, a combat modifier. What you do is you add this combat modifier onto your d6 roll, and as a result, you get a number. And based on the number that you get, you will then uh, look to the CRT in Death Maze and see how many wounds you will um, impart on the, your victim. However, Looking at the orcs here, we see that there's a W there. What this means is that they are carrying weapons, and orcs are mean, and they're obviously very human-like, so they, like us, have weapons. There happened to be one of four weapons in Death Maze that they could have, a dagger, a throwing dagger, a bow, or a sword, hammer, or axe. And based on what they are carrying, they will be inflicting a certain number of wounds. You can see the table, whoops, sort of right here. So to determine who's carrying what, I'll be rolling this d4, and I will uh, then go to that particular column of the, um, the die roll to see what happens. And because I said we are going to be playing this somewhat fluidly, there's no rolling for initiative or whatever, but there is obviously back and forth. I'm not doing a million simultaneous things here. We have to imagine what happened. We went into the guard room. We were not necessarily expecting the guards, but the guards were already there. So my sense is that the guards are going to be at the ready. They will have heard us coming, and we will be receiving the attack first from the guards. So this first orc here is going to attack us. Now I had us in a party order. Um, I think I had, let's see, who did I have first? I think I had this fellow here, our thief first. And we're not um, playing on a grid or anything like that. This is, again, somewhat loosey-goosey. I got to move this off. And I'm not going to go through all this detail for everything, but I do want to show you what I'm doing here initially. So my thief here, my elf thief is standing there in the front. He has a knife, a sword. He's also got the capacity for missile weapons. He's got a crossbow. He does have a shield. And um, I had left it undetermined when we last checked in about whether or not he was wearing armor, but I've decided he is wearing armor that is going to absorb one wound. He has, just to remind you, a strength of eight. Uh, so there is to say a health of eight, dexterity of 12, and and an IQ of 12. And this orc here is going to be coming for him with a weapon, and we're going to see what weapon he's carrying there. We rolled a four, and based on that table, he's got a, a sword or a hammer or an axe. <laughs> it's kind of vague, I guess, but that's what he's got, a sword, hammer, or an axe, and we're going to go with that. So what we do is we take our d6 right here, and we're rolling for his attack, and we rolled a five, not great, and we are 
are going to be looking down here. Well, that's actually not too bad. He's carrying off this column, sword, hammer, axe, only rolled a five, and he does one damage. So I'm going to keep this bookkeeping off um, camera, but I am going to be keeping track of the wounds that um, everybody has. All right, so what happens here now is our... Uh, human scholar, before anything else can happen, before the wizards can react possibly with a spell or the priest can react with a spell, our cat familiar that's with a human scholar is a going to pounce because that's what a cat would do pounce into danger even though it's a big orc. Now we are told that our cat familiar has a. Um, a dexterity of 14, and this is significant because anybody trying to attack this cat is going to be doing so at a minus three, well, minus three dexterity, but also stepping down three from the roll. So the cat's going to be hard to hit, but it's only going to do a little bit of damage. It's just going to do one point of damage. So um, this is what's going to happen. But on this side of things, we need to roll to see whether it's actually going to hit. So to do the two hit roll, now again, we're playing with different um, sets of rules for us and for them, and um, you know, you, you just that's the way it is. Um, it makes sense to me, but might not might, might not make sense to you. I get that, uh, but it does make sense to me. At least we'll try to be consistent and remember <laughs> that we're doing this as we go. So the first thing we need to do is roll three d six against our dexterity to see whether we're going to hit. Now I mentioned the cat's dexterity was uh, fourteen, right? Is that what I said? Yes, fourteen. So uh, we need to roll. Um, at or below that number to have a successful hit. Let's get that out of the way so we're not confused here. And here we go, eight, or eight, eight, nine. So cat's going to be successful. It's going to land one wound on this orc here, and we will keep track of that again off camera. I'm going to be using these really awesome, funky, um, numbered, chits to designate my orc. So this is going to be orc number one, and orc number one is going to sit just like that. So we'll do this. The other point to make, I forgot, is that in this game, each monster has its own individual health. So not it's not like all orcs have the same health. We didn't see initially what this orc has. This right here is going to tell you how many d6s to roll, that's the number, and then what number to add or subtract from that to get the total wound points that it will take to kill this orc. So uh, the most this could have is six health, and the least, of course, it could be one because there's no addition. So we're going to roll our d6. He's got a five health, and I'm going to keep track of this. Orc number one has a five health, and now he is down to four, and this is where we are. So um, <laughs> no, I need to go back and remind myself what happened. Um, the cat jumped, did a wound, and um, and now what probably is going to be happening is our uh, party is going to be quickly trying to see what they can do. And I believe our wizards are going to be trying something here. Why not? Or I should say our wizard and perhaps our priest. Now in the... Um, in the Labyrinth Rules with magic there, they talk about casting magic in pressure situations. So what you need to do um, with this is to see whether or not you can successfully cast the spell and then attempt to cast the spell. If it is a thrown spell, that is to say a spell at a distance, you're going to be losing, um, you're going to be adjusting your dexterity, which is what you need to roll against to see if you can cast it, by the number of hexes away. Again, here I am not playing on any kind of map, and it is going to be approximate in terms of the distance. If I wanted to, I could go to, for example, this random table. This comes from Scarlet Heroes um, that I have printed out, and I could, if I wanted to, utilize this to determine how far away something was. So um, it's pretty clear what you're doing here. You're rolling 2d4 and coming up with a value um, for that. But that doesn't give you the hex number. Then again, you would need to approximate what 
type of adjustment that would be on your dexterity. If I really wanted to, I could do that beforehand. So I could um, do the dexterity modifiers. I'm not going to get that detailed for this video, or at least for right now in this video, because frankly, it's just too much for me to keep track of and keep, keep this going. But just to show you different ways of things that can be built into the storyline. And if you are playing this um, actually solo and not sort of trying to do what I'm doing here, which is playing it and demonstrating it, you can get really involved. And this, I find that this particular chart is very useful because it just takes those decisions out of your hand. And um, especially if you pre-assign a value, in this case tied to what that dexterity modifier would be, it gives you that, um, which you need to determine the success or failure of what you're doing. So let me think about what the wizards are going to do and come back and discuss it. All right, well, as it turns out, we have a drop weapon spell. This is from our wizard, and it is a thrown spell, as I was just talking about. And this is what our wizard is going to do, because if our wizard can cast a spell on this hammer-wielding orc and cause the orc to drop the weapon, I'm going to say that that renders this orc out of the fight for good. And we've got to deal with four of them. So we are going to attempt to cast that spell. And we're going to take a look here. I have these cards printed out and they are assigned to the wizard and the priest. Just makes it easy for me to reference. This is just um, from the text of the rules itself. Uh, it says it makes the, the victim drop whatever is in his hand. And um, well, it does that. Okay. It costs one strength point. So here we are just looking over here. We're going to see we need to uh, spend this strength point to do that. And um, it says it's two strength points if the victim's basic strength is 20 or more. Well, that's not the case here. And um, let's see, that's about it for that. So now we need to attempt to see whether it is going to land. It's a thrown spell. I mentioned this chart here, and in fact, I have assigned values on dexterity modifier. So I'm going to do a, actually just roll my d4 here to determine, well, how far away is this wizard from this orc? We don't really know, or at least I'm saying we don't know. So I'm gonna do a roll here, and I rolled a one. And so on this one, two, three, four, close enough to touch, no modifier off the dexterity for that. The dexterity of my uh, human wizard is a 10. So what I need to do now, let's see if there are any other modifiers. The modifiers to the throne spells, let me just find that for you and show you what I am referring to. All right, well, it just is what I said. There is really the only, only that modifier. So to figure the dexterity adjustment on a throne spell, subtract one from each hex from the wizard to his target. So we already talked about that. So there is no modification to the dexterity, but we need to roll, um, and you can see it here, explained a little more fully. Sorry about this here. Minus one for every hex, etc. So um, if there was a sort of line of sight intervention with another character in front, um, then we would need to figure that. But we're not doing that right now. We could, you know, again, you could use your depending on what you wanted to do and how detailed you wanted to get, you could certainly use um, some basic uh, question, um, you know, question and answers to determine were, was anybody blocking this wizard? You know, I've got this set up. Is this guy blocking it? I'm going to just say no for simplicity's sake. So what we need to do first off is roll three d6s against our dexterity of, what did I say? 10 to determine whether this spell is even actually going to hit or not. And um, you know what? That's not so great. We're paying for it regardless of whether it hits. So we've already paid for it with a strength point. And we did. We're good. We're good on that. So the spell is going to work. What this does now is it's going to take this orc right out of the mix. And we're going to continue on now. The orcs are probably enraged because this spell has... Um, has taken out one of their one of their own, and this orc is going to rise up and um, and start to fight. So what we're going to determine first here, we should have done this last time. This is orc number two. First of all, what how strong is this guy? Well, he's only a one. <laughs> awesome. So he only has a one health, and he is carrying this weapon. So we need to roll our d4 to determine what weapon he is 
um, wielding, and we're going to do that. I just lost my d4. Okay, we're rolling, and we're on a three. I think we, that was what we got before, right? One, two, three. Nope, he's got a bow. He's got a bow, and um, so he will be rolling his d6 to determine, <coughs> excuse me, how many um, wounds he can place. Now, the max is going to be one. This isn't actually so bad. And who is he going to be attacking? Well, I'm going to say he's going for this guy right here. This is our uh, scholar with that cat familiar. Now the cat familiar is dancing around here. Nobody has, um, nobody's really going to try to deal with that cat, I think. We're just simply going to say he's too difficult to get because his dexterity is so high. But um, we're going right here for the scholar and we'll see based on our roll. We only got a two. He misses. So he sends off his shot and it goes over the head and lands in the stone and everyone on our team is safe. So our priest here is just going to go for it. The priest has a summon wolf spell and this is going to bring a wolf into play and roaming around and trying to get these orcs. It's going to cost him two strength points to cast so we're going to mark that off here plus one to keep him around and um, we, I realized actually I've got to, um, the cat familiar is still here and um, stuff is happening so we got to pay the cost of that. Now, I should say, you're only allowed to cast one spell per turn, and per encounter is the way I'm playing it, and you cannot recast those spells until you do your healing and your rest. So you have to do sort of some management, not only of the available spell points that you have, which are right up here, and are also your strength, but you need to manage and determine what you're going to cast and when. So as I said, we're just going to go for it. We've got now just this single orc. We probably won't be targeting this guy because his health is only one, but we do have this wolf, and so the uh, priest is going to send off this wolf to attack another orc in the back, and let's just see right now what what strength we get for orc number three. Let's see how strong that guy is. He's going to have a strength of three, so I'll note that down. And so orc two's got a strength of one, orc three's got a strength of three. And the last guy there, Orc 4, wow. All right, so these, are, these aren't the strongest Orcs. The strongest one we, we got rid of with that spell. So Orc 3 at this point has the strength of 3. We have a wolf prowling around. We're going to attempt combat there. And I think I'm going to do the rest of this part of the encounter off camera uh, just for sort of length's uh, sake because I think you're getting a sense of what I'm doing here. And I'll come back and I'll let you know what happened. All right, so combat has ended. The wolf took out the strength three orc, and the uh, strength one orc got off a shot at the uh, scholar. So the scholar's down to nine health and got one experience point because he ended up taking out that guy that shot him, that orc that shot him. Our human wizard's down to four health because he's maintaining a lot of spells here. So we have to bear this in mind. And this is, again, part of the challenge of the game and, you know, sort of wantonly using our spells and magic and stuff like that. Having that familiar, we may need to get rid of that familiar because we can't maintain it. The wolf we're getting rid of, that's going to be a one shot and out. Uh, our elf thief is down to, uh, took a hit down to seven health and the dwarf priest is at eight health. We did gain some experience because we got rid of all of those orcs, so we got experience for that one point each for getting rid of the orc, plus points based on their health values in terms of who took them out. And that's where, you know, had they been stronger, we would have gotten more experience, but we certainly did accrue some experience for all of that. And then now we are on our way. Or are we? This is the question. So now we're in this empty room. It is was described as an armory. The question is, do we want to spend some time, look around, see whether there are any weapons that we can, say, pick up and use? We could certainly do that. Um, and to do that, I would go to one of the um, Oracle... Uh, question answer responses that I'm using. I've got sort of three going here that my basic percentile one is this one and um, you know it, you could use whatever you want. I'm sort of 
picking and choosing a little bit. I had the um, the Scarlet Heroes one somewhere, here it is, that I really like because it gives you a little more variance in your questions and answer. Um, in other videos I've shown that I've used the Mythic one because I'm keeping track of chaos. Now I'm not doing that here, it's just too much for me to keep track of in doing the video, but I often keep track of chaos because I really like that metric and I like changing, I like how the success or failure of what happened um, will determine yes or no because it kind of plays into this, I guess you could call it superstition or belief or whatever that, you know, lucky people have good things that happen to them and unlucky people have bad things. So I like that, but I'm not doing that here. Um, in any case, so we could ask a question, you know, we're in an armory. Um, what is the likelihood that there are some weapons here that we could that we could use? Well, you know what, it, I would say that's very likely. Um, at least likely, There's the weapons are here. The question is, can we use them? So I could use this. Um, I don't know that I'm actually going to do that right now, but I'll show you how it works. Um, you probably, many of you probably know this, but this is based on a D20, and um, I would say the likelihood I would assess, I'm in a weapon room. Um, are there weapons here that can be taken and used? I'm going to say that it, let's just say likely, because maybe they're broken. We'll say likely. So we're going to be rolling here, and we rolled a 12. So yes, there are likely weapons to be used. Well, that was easy. If we got one of these answers, anything of that column, let's say we, ro let's say we rolled a 10. Um, then what we would do, it says yes, but we would go to the other side of this card and we would roll a d6 to determine one. Yes, but a twist to the relationship between people and the situation. Well, this is when we have to bring in our creativity. Perhaps some members of the party want to take the weapon. Perhaps some don't. Perhaps there's some disagreement as to who gets the weapon. Perhaps our uh, totally unweaponed um, scholar wants the weapon and other people don't want him to have it. I mean, you could go off in many different directions uh, with this. And, you know, this is why I'm not going to do it here because I need to move ahead for myself in the filming and um, certainly in the video. But this is where after this um, encounter with the orcs was over, you could continue the encounter. And while I'm calling this an, an encounter and not just a combat to see what happened. Now, during the course of this, if we were sort of standing around doing stuff and something led to something else and there were other enemies that came into being, that would still be part of the same encounter. So um, until you move, until you sort of close the encounter down and move on, you're still under the same uh, considerations of your health, of your uh, magic points. Of course, these are not going to restore until you can heal after three encounters. So this is again an external constraint that I put on the game as it plays out to help with the narrative, to help move things forward, to help create tension, and to basically serve as the external GM would serve in terms of moving a story along and in terms of forcing um, new things to happen. Now, is there anything wrong with standing around in this room for the rest of your play experience and just seeing what's here and rolling on tables and describing it? No, of course not. But uh, for the purposes of this set up for the purposes of this adventure. I have a goal in mind. I want to get to the people who are waiting to be rescued, to get to that gate, to secure that gate. And to do that, I need to keep moving forward. So, you know, there's always a balance between the uh, narrative exposition and the narrative, I guess, thrust, you'd call it, of the story moving forward. And um, this is how one of the ways that I find to help myself move forward in the story. So that's going to be the end of our first encounter. We're going to move on through the map and I'm going to do the rest of this off camera and um, maybe come back and summarize what happened. Um, I'm not sure. I got to figure that out. But now, now I'm going to go play. After completing this encounter, we 
have left this guard room and made our way down the stairs because we want to get to the second level. So we've come down the stairs. We had a brief encounter on the stairs that I didn't show you. And we have come up now the stairs here. So this is our third encounter. And we are entering this narrow hallway. What we have in mind right now is we want to pick this up. This is some magical item that's been left behind and I want it. And then I'm going to move on. We are entering a narrow hallway. It is dark and there is a limited sight range that's going to impact our combat if there is any combat. There seems to be some magic here. There is a little bit of smoke in the air. It's very cold but the air is still and um, we see in the distance perhaps a damaged weapon that somebody has left behind. It is a passageway and there's some sense that it's a connection of time and space here. There's a magical force in some way that's permeating the air. We use a detect life spell to see whether um, there's something here that is going to help us in some way. We don't get any answers from that. and We wasted our spell um, on that. And um, this is our third encounter. So we are down, our wizard is down to his four strength points left because he's used some spells before. And um, we're going to now take a look and see what we see. The first thing we need to do is roll for nuisance because I decided that once every 10 squares we will roll for that as opposed to once every 30 because that scale wasn't really working. And on a 5 or 6 on the green die there will be a nuisance and if there is it will be determined by the sum of these two black dice. So we'll roll over here and whoop, looks like that is a six. All right, we got a six and a four. So we go to our nuisance uh, table here and we see, ugh, 50 rats, really? Seriously? All right, it's 50 rats. I need to look up the implications of that. That's, that's pretty gross. All right, I don't want to spend a lot of time here because my purpose is to show you the uh, Valkyrie Castle combat, but uh, what the advantage of using an existing rule set is that you do get some guidance. So this is the Nuisance Encounters area from the in the Labyrinth, which is where I was getting my 50 rats from. And it says uh, the GM does not have to bring the nuisances into play immediately, etc. May vary this table to suit themselves or create an entirely new one, of course. Um, random creatures should be confined to those that would logically have been found wandering aimlessly in the area. Well, there could be 50 rats in this hallway, of course. Looking up the actual rats here, there's a lengthy uh, description of what they do, and I'm going to, I am going to modify this because there's no way I'm going to conduct 50 rounds of combat for, you know, each rat attacking. Um, but it is nice that there is this rubric here that I could use if I wanted to. I'm not going to. What I am going to do, however, is to continue to fund, as it were, or to keep into play this cat familiar that I have. I was going to let him go because it's costing me two magic strength per turn, and I'm down here right now to, now I'm down to two. Two magic strength, two health. I've used a spell already um, coming through, so I, I don't have a spell left because I tried to use the detect magic spell that didn't work. Um, but I'm going to keep that cat, I'm going to send the cat in, and I'm going to say that when the cat comes in, these rats scatter for the time being. So that's how I'm going to deal with that. Some artistic license here, but whatever it is. So we're coming in here, and we're going to pull in and see what we find and how we deal with it. So we're going to go to our cup here, and I'm going to be pulling in a um, number of enemies to face. We are in the second level here, so we are choosing um, a D3 amount of enemies to face, and so we got three. All right, let's see if we can show you what we get. One, one two, three. And we have a skeleton, we have a medusa, and we have a gargoyle. 
Skeleton, Medusa, and Gargoyle are lurking here, and I will show you how I deal with at least one of them just to get in some of the actual combat rules from Valkenburg Castle, which are in play when my party is attacking. So I've set up these folks as I would looking at the scenario here. They are obviously guarding this magic item, whatever it is that we're really trying to get. And the gargoyle is the strongest of these. And then the medusa and the skeleton. I'm going to say the skeleton is going to come running willy-nilly down the hallway. You recall we do need to ascertain the strength of these, of these uh, characters. So the gargoyle is going to have a 3d6 plus 1 strength, the medusa 2d6, and the skeleton 1d6. So we're going to quickly let's just do this um, so what did we get here we got 9 10 11 12 the gargoyle has 13 health that's going to be rough and the medusa is going to have 2d6 that's only three okay and our skeleton is going to have a health of two all right now the point of what i'm trying to do here we are in a corridor, we're dealing with a narrow line of sight, and it is dark. So what we need to do is check out the modifiers that are going to be applied to our D6 roll to see what we get as we try to attack this skeleton with our um, bow and arrow here. So now we go to the Valkenburg Castle rules here, and I'm using an amalgam of the two rules that I discussed earlier, the two CRTs that I discussed earlier. The ultimate modifications we get, we're in a narrow area here. The ultimate modifications I have come up with is we are getting a plus one because we're in a non-adjacent square, so that's giving us a plus one. We are getting a minus one because um, per the class modifier here, you can't see, they call it a burglar here we're with our thief that is a minus one and then we're getting another minus one for darkness so the ultimate modifier here on our roll is going to be minus one and we're rolling a d6 and then we're reading the value off this table here to see how many wounds we get to inflict now the skeleton has a health of two so um, here's our d6 and uh, let's roll it over here so we can see it and we rolled a six awesome so however that's actually a five and so that's going to be one wound in fact if we didn't have that modifier we would have just gotten rid of that skeleton in one fell swoop but because it's dark um, and we are a thief and we ultimately ended at a minus one we're going to just inflict the one wound on the skeleton right now the skeleton himself of course is going to be um, coming and charging at us, fighting back. He's got no weapons. Um, he's going to move forward and fight back against us. He has the two uh, modifier to his roll, so he's going to be rolling his d6, and he's going to get a plus two to that, and he rolls a five, which is a seven, so he is going to be inflicting one wound on us. Again, this is back to the death maze table. Sorry about that. There we go. So he's inflicted one wound on our thief. We're going to keep track of that, and basically this is how it's going to go. Now, uh, this video is getting really maxing out on what I can uh, film and upload and my technology. I just uh, get too involved here to keep it short. So uh, I'm going to conduct this combat off camera. We're going to get to this item hopefully again this is our third encounter so we're a little weak here on health um, and we're going to see what this is and then i'll wrap it up and this is it this is what we what we ended up getting this spinning wheel um, we are a lot of us are out of it at the moment we need to do some healing but we did fight our way through the gargoyle the skeleton we're out of magic and um, we got the spinning wheel so the spinning wheel, these magic items were pulled in from a different game, and I'm looking here at what the spinning wheel has meant in the game that it came from. The spinning wheel spins straw into gold. In game terms, this enables the owning player to take one more mercenary than specified each time they are recruited by random events. Well, that obviously is irrelevant to our game. What's the point? Well, it spins straw into gold. Now, we have been attempting, remember we have this uh, 
this potion thing, this green smoky, I think it's smoky potion that we got from the air elemental. We have been unable to figure out uh, what it means, how it's going to help us. And um, perhaps, perhaps this spinning wheel, I will think about this, will bump us up, say, on the um, charts we're rolling on to a more likely answer because it is taking straw into gold. It is turning one thing of no value into something of value and maybe that thing is the potion. So this is something I'll be carrying around and thinking about how to use as I move forward. And um, you know at, at this point I'm as I said at my at my limit here of um, easy capacity to upload things and this tends to happen sometimes when I get too involved in something and um, the, I don't have a ton of concluding remarks at this point to make. I mean I um, hope that this demonstration has shown how you can take basic rule you know rule sets from using rule sets from three or four different games and RPGs and I'm using some um, random uh, restrictive type of question and answer things from a couple of different people who have created them for different games and just kind of putting a mishmash together and pulling from it what is useful to me and what makes sense to me and also just bringing in a few things where relevant that have nothing to do with the game world like this book that I love to go to to see unfortunately not everything is in here because this is you know this is not meant for fantasy gamers but there are some things in here that can add in um, it, it serves as a suggestive another suggestive element when you get somewhere and you look something up and it is in here it can help you with a direction and, and again serve to be like an external GM even though you are the one creating that information for yourself it makes it a little bit less like it's just you making something up and actually it coming from somewhere so that is a look inside my adventure I'm gonna proceed on off camera and um, probably just stop at the third room that I had with that um, magic item that we saw that was guarded by the undead and um, see what's that and you know maybe save my characters for a later time. Thanks for watching.